I'm Dr. Nigel Carter, Chief Executive of the Oral Health Foundation, and I'm delighted to introduce you to this webinar. We've recently been uh, working on a project uh, in association with GSK to produce a white paper on the recommendations and usage of denture adhesives. Funding for the production of the white paper on denture adhesives was provided by GlaxoSmithKline to the Oral Health Foundation, but they had no editorial input or control on what we've produced. As a student, I was taught very clearly that if a patient had to use a denture adhesive, then we had failed in our production uh, of the dentures. The project that we've been uh, involved in uh, has involved an international global expert panel with experts ranging from uh, Japan through to America and a number of experts in Europe. I'm joined today by three of those uh, experts. Professor David Felton from the University of Missouri, uh, Professor Angus Walls from the Edinburgh Dental Institute, and Dr. Guy Gotham from King's College London uh, Dental Institute are each going to deal with an aspect uh, of the subject. Our expert panel consisted, as I said, of experts from uh, across the globe and who are really renowned in their field uh, and met several times to produce the guidelines uh, which are being launched today. The white paper that we've produced is science-based uh, and comes up with the best available knowledge that we have on the use of denture adhesives and their benefits for oral and general health. Edentialism, according to the glossary of prosthodontic terminology, is the state of being without natural teeth. So that's where a patient has no natural teeth, either primary teeth or permanent teeth. The impact is pretty dramatic. If you think about a patient that looks like the slide on the right side of the screen here, a patient who has no teeth or no replacement teeth is gonna have a great deal of difficulty in chewing many types of foods. So their diet typically becomes very soft and very carbohydrate rich which leads in many instances to obesity and diabetes and other health considerations. Also without teeth and because the tissues, both hard and soft tissues, tend to resorb over time, you have a dramatic impact on the patient's aesthetics, which has an impact on their self-esteem, their quality of life. And because you have no teeth in the back part of the mouth here for a patient to chew on, you have an issue with support of the joints. And there's an example of that. The long-term impact really is for the potential for chronic uh, denture-related irritations. We know that over time the bone and soft tissues remodel and resorb, but the dentures don't. This is due to continual bone loss, especially in the lower arch where it's accentuated, and this can have a dramatic impact on the general systemic health. Here's an issue where uh, patients have uh, sores in the mouth that are caused by ill-fitting dentures. And there's some good evidence to suggest that uh, these chronic irritated areas can actually turn into oral cancer. We know that bone loss is continual from the time the teeth are removed and it's chronic. So a patient starts out at a, a bone level that you see here in this particular panoramic image. And over 15 or 20 years, or 30 years, it may end up looking like this. Typically, the maxilla resorbs at one rate and the mandible resorbs at a greater and more rapid rate. And this was actually categorized many years ago by both Atwood, as you see here, and by studies by Tallgren out of Scandinavia. And the white lines here indicate where the bone originally started on this particular patient. And you can see where the bone has resorbed to. And again, it's accentuated in the mandible, mandible, mandibular arch. Interestingly, according to the World Health Organization, a patient that has no teeth meets their criteria for being physically impaired, disabled, and handicapped. And when I learned that about my edentulous patients, uh, it really did bring home the fact that I needed to do something really extra special for them. 
So what are the treatment options for treating the patient that has no teeth? And as you can see here, this patient is devoid of teeth in both arches. We can make dentures, which are a good alternative for these patients. The positive impact of having dentures in a patient that has no teeth is it does improve the ability for them to chew, gives them the opportunity to chew things they couldn't do without teeth. It does improve the aesthetics because it replaces not only the teeth but the soft tissues. It improves their quality of life and self-esteem and it does support the temporomandibular joints. However, we still know that long-term use of dentures will lead to bone loss. Our goal is to provide our patients with incredibly well-fitting dentures. The positives of that are that we have very good opportunities to have good adaptation or fit of the upper denture. The dentures do replace both hard and soft tissues, the teeth and the gingiva. There's balanced articulation can be provided which can help stabilize the dentures and they're relatively low in cost. The downsides are that while the upper denture fits usually very well, the lower dentures are where most patients have problems. There's movement and instability of the lower dentures and there's continual bone loss beneath both the dentures which require relines or remakes. And unfortunately, one of the biggest problems we face is that very few people have a very adequate denture recall program in their practices. So these patients aren't seen except when they break something or when something hurts. How do we improve the fit of dentures? Well, denture fit is really a, uh, related to the polymerization shrinkage of the acrylic resins as the dentures are, are fabricated. And we can overcome those by improving our impression techniques, by injecting molded dentures, which helps minimize the polymerization shrinkage, by milling the dentures with CAD CAM technology, or by the use of dent dental adhesives. So here's a lower custom tray specific for a patient that's been border molded properly and you can see we have an optimum complete denture impression. On the lower left part of the screen we have an injection molded denture that's being fabricated and on the right side is a CAD CAM denture both of which will help minimize the uh, lack of fit of the denture base. And our goal is to provide the patient with not only an aesthetic but an incredibly well-fitting denture that's in proper occlusion. What we don't want to see is patients that show up in our practices like this, where the teeth are worn, the dentures don't fit, the patients have done home relines uh, to try to uh, facilitate an improvement in fit, or where they're using excessive denture adhesives to help retain or stabilize these dentures. And we need to keep in mind the fact that not all edentulous patients want dentures, not all of them can afford dentures, and not all of them need dentures if they have uh, a decent amount of remaining bone and soft tissues. For these patients, optimal complete dentures are very acceptable. So how do these patients maintain bone over this 20 to 50 year pay period of using dentures? I think we really need to revisit uh, the information from Tallgren and Atwood because I don't think they told the whole story here. Is it that the patients have good genetics? Is their home care very good? Is it a lack of inflammation? Is the occlusion correct on the dentures that they've worn? Or can dental adhesives help in these conditions? You have to start the process with properly border molded and custom trays and impeccable final impressions as I discussed earlier. And if you notice the sets of dentures here, uh, this is the tissue set, uh, contacting surface on the upper and the cameo surface on the lower. This is on the same patient and you can see there's a dramatic difference between a properly border molded and extended denture and one that's not. The properly border molded one gives good support and stability, the other one does not. So can dental adhesives help? Or does that necessarily imply future uh, or failure of the dentures? And the answer is absolutely not. There's great uh, information out there that looks at uh, the fact that dental adhesives can improve the retention of dentures, the stability of dentures, and the masticatory chewing efficiency, especially in well-fitting dentures. And there's a the reference as shown there. So in summary, edentulism continues to be an enormous global health concern uh, burden in both developed and developing countries. It does not appear that the need for complete dentures will disappear in the future, so dentures are not a thing of the past. We're going to have them around for a long time. 
the criteria for predicting the long-term effects of edentulism on any individual patient are really lacking. Properly constructed and well-fitting dentures are an acceptable treatment for our edentulous patients. But adhesives can help these patients. So the population of England in 2009 was 50.65 million and by 2029 that will have grown to 60.26 million. But the proportion of those who are edentulous is falling quite rapidly as is seen by the red elements on these columns. And so in 2009 there were about 2.8 million people who had no natural teeth and that will have fallen in 2029 to 0.52 million, a really huge change in oral health status and one that we need to think about in terms of delivery of care to this part of the population. Edentulism is something which has been falling dramatically in the UK as can be seen by these data from the National Studies of Adult Mental Health over the last 40 years. And perhaps the most interesting thing on this particular illustration is the trend line. And this is the trend line for people who were 35 in 1968, 45 in 1978, and so on. And you can see that initially the rates of edentulism within this age cohort rose, and then it fell from uh, 1988 down to 2009. And I would pose the question, how does edentulism fall? And the only explanation for a fall in the rate of edentulism is selective mortality. People who wear complete dentures die younger than those who do not. Now that doesn't mean that wearing dentures causes you to die. There's an awful lot of social confounding in here because edentulism very much is part of the life experience of the poor and the inaccessible in this country as opposed to the wealthy and the affluent. So what about complete dentures? What do we think that they are? In, from my perspective, complete dentures are a very poor prosthetic replacement for a natural dentition. They're two lumps of pink plastic that float around inside the mouth and our patients, our clients, have to juggle them with their lips and their tongue to allow any form of sensible function. And put in that context, they are a very, very poor prosthesis. In terms of aesthetics, they can be quite good, but in terms of function, they pose very significant challenges for our clients, for our patients. So what factors do patients value in terms of dentures, complete dentures and denture function? They value most the ability to chew, and then the ability to speak, followed by comfort, stability, and appearance. So if we look at dentures and quality of life, and these data are from Mark Thomason and his colleagues from the University of Newcastle, looking at quality of life in the edentulous patient, and you'll see there's a huge range from people who are very comfortable with their quality of life and dentures at one end, to people who have very significant barriers and inhibitions at the other. And I'd just like to share with you some quotes from this study telling us about the quality of life an individual's experience. And we'll start off at the good end. So at the good end, the most comfortable dentures I've ever had. They're fantastic, they're brilliant. And as for eating, I eat anything. And it doesn't affect us. Uh, it doesn't affect me, us as the Geordie vernacular. I can manage it, no problem, problem at all with these dentures. Mark assures me that they were made by one of his dental students in the dental hospital. But at the other end, of course, you have things to do with public constraint, such as carrots and greens and all. You're supposed to eat plenty of them being a diabetic, but I can't bite them unless I mash them. There again, if you go out to a meal, you can't sit mashing them. It doesn't look good, but at home, it doesn't matter. Sometimes in my own house, I would sit and peel an apple into slices and, you know, eat it like that. I like apples, but I wouldn't sit in front of you now and eat that apple because I feel conscious. And so quality of life is really important, as is chewing efficiency. And you see here images of people with a limited number of natural teeth and an individual with complete dentures 
and no natural teeth. And, you see, and we see differences in chewing efficiency between those individuals. And those differences in chewing efficiency drive a change in food's choice, in the foods that people choose to eat. And that change in food's choice, in turn, results in alterations in diet and dietary intake. So arguably, we don't need to chew food with modern foods preparation. But if we change the foods that we eat because of food's choice and limitations associated with complete dentures, then we change our dietary pattern. And that change in dietary pattern has been demonstrated both in the UK and the US and many other countries. And so what do we know about denture adhesives and how they might influence the changes I've just described? And there are a limited number of studies in this domain that I'm going to share with you. The first here from David Bartlett and his group, a very small study, but did show increase in fruits and vegetables intake over a 30-day period and did show improvements in oral health-related quality of life associated with adhesive use. Nicholas and colleagues, an improvement in oral health-related quality of life, and they showed quite clearly here that in group two, which was a group who used an adhesive for one time period and then stopped, that that improvement in quality of life decreased when adhesive use was stopped. Colleagues this time from Buffalo in New York, in, in New York State, and these were studies that were undertaken by um, using dentures that, or denture-wearing individuals who had been part of the prosthodontics master's program at to the State University of New York. So these were very well-made, well-fitting dentures. And yet, within that cohort, the use of a denture adhesive was associated with improved retention and stability of the well-fitting dentures, fewer dislodgements were reported when eating crisp foods, and greater confidence. So we see higher levels of bite force, we see higher levels of, of a denture wobble in those not using a denture adhesive, and we see improvements in comfort, confidence, in comfort, and in satisfaction in those who were using a denture adhesive. And finally, a more recent study from Brazil looking at denture stability and mandibular movement. And again, we see improvement in the patient satisfaction with denture use in those who are using an adhesive and altered mandibular movements with increases in vertical movements during chewing and less lateral movement during chewing on the right-hand side of these two uh, sets of, of kinesiographs where the individual was using an adhesive compared with those on the left where they were not. And so in summary, complete dentures are a poor substitute for natural teeth. The use of complete dentures affects oral health related quality of life and both foods choice and nutritional intake. And finally, the use of a denture adhesive improves patient confidence, oral health related quality of life and chewing function and may result in improved dietary choice when associated with, with correct dietary advice. I would like to present to you a global report on evidence-based guidelines for the use of denture adhesives and their benefits for oral health and general health. And I'm very pleased and very happy to do that. Uh, mainly, first of all, because it's the first time that we have looked at all the guidelines who are available in the literature and we have tried to synthesize it to one set of guidelines for denture wearing patients so that they know how to use a denture adhesive, when to apply it and how to apply it. Secondly, I think it's an important uh, report because it also, um, I think, refer to what is available in the science and evidence on why dental professionals should recommend more often and more consistently denture adhesives to their denture wearing patients. Therefore, I think improving the health of their denture wearing patients and so that they can live their life at the fullest. As an introduction, um, as we heard uh, from Angus already, dentures are made for people who have lost some of or all of their teeth. Usually as a dentist we think very much mechanically on how we can replace teeth by an, uh, our natural teeth by artificial teeth, let's call it. But I think dentures do more. Dentures help patients to improve their appearance, 
which support their lips and cheeks, improve their self-esteem and confidence, improve their chewing ability, and so help maintain healthy nutrition, as we just learned from Angus as well. So I think as a dental professional, we have to start thinking a little bit beyond only the mechanical and think about what Kibati can do for our patients to make their lives much more comfortable, much more enjoyable, even at a later age. So coming to denture adhesives, I'm not going into the details about the composition of um, the denture adhesives because that will take us too far away, but three major components are part of the modern denture adhesives on the market. First of all, they have the adhesive agents who are delivering the adhesion between the denture and the mucosa. There is antimicrobial agents reducing the microbial growth in the adhesive and then other agents to help with application, storage, freshness, and so on. On the market there are different forms. Creams, powder, and strips are the most known. Um, when we looked at the literature with the team, we found out that on powder and strips, there are very, very limited scientific uh, reports on the efficacy of these um, particular forms. And that's why we have focused on where the most of the science is, and that's on the creams. So whenever we talk in the future now on, on these guidelines, think about denture adhesive creams. The working mechanism is um, quite straightforward. It's a combination of physical and chemical properties. And the physical properties really come from a combination of cohesive and adhesive forces. I don't know if you still remember from your students' time what cohesion and adhesion means, but the cohesion is the one that keeps the things together in the adhesive layer, and they are related to the level of hydration coming from the saliva mainly in the mouth, and then the formation of fibular structures in this um, physical adhesive layer. The adhesion properties coming between the adhesive, between the adhesive layer and the mucosa on one side and the denture on the other side. And it's the combination of these two, difficult, the two different adhesive and cohesive forces that makes the, um, the adhesive really work in the mouth. At this moment, and we looked at the literature and we looked at the, on the internet on different sites and everything to find out what is the optimal way of applying denture adhesive. And there is very, very few guidelines available at the moment. And that's one of the main reasons that this Global Test Task Force found it really relevant to develop these guidelines now for optimal use of denture adhesives. So that's one thing. The other one is the removal of denture adhesives. And there is still some research to be done. Honestly, there we didn't find any of the uh, particular um, guidelines or guidance that existed on the removal of denture adhesives being sufficiently uh, scientifically uh, supported to uh, really help uh, or give us any guidance on how to remove denture adhesives. Um, denture performance comes to technical excellence during the manufacture of the prosthesis and coming from you, dental professional, but also from the, the dental lab, of course. And then there is this improved perceived comfort while using the denture by effective management of the patient. And I think there as well is there kind of, I think, we have to highlight that probably the effective management of the patient is not always done properly as it should be uh, by dental professionals because of the focus that we have on the technical excellence. There is definitely an increasing, uh, a possibility to increase the patient's sense of security and satisfaction through improved retention and stability, chewing ability, increased chewing performance, like we just learned from Angus, and the reduction or elimination of buildup of food debris beneath the denture. And we'll come back to that in a second as well, but it seems to be a very important one. And a, a recent research showed that about 86% of denture wearers are complaining about the uh, food debris uh, staying underneath their denture and making them feeling uncomfortable. So the comfort and the, the improved comfort while using a denture is an important topic, as uh, an important reason for using denture adhesives. Today, oral health and general health cannot be looked into iso in isolation anymore. There is too much, if you look at the recent um, FDI, uh, World Dental Federation, uh, uh, let's say definition of oral health, it includes all the well-being, social well-being, 
uh, and all the other uh, areas of um, uh, feeling well and health status related to um, general health and uh, to oral health, and that's also uh, uh, relevant for general health. We know that chewing difficulties in older patients are associated with the activities of daily living, cognitive status, and even depression. Uh, other studies have shown that uh, with, uh, the poor, health, poor oral health status was predictive of a poor general health status. And there is even, and uh, Angus referred to that one already, the study from David Barlett, there is some limited evidence that exists that people with complete dentures or use dental adhesives will eat a healthier diet. But there are challenges associated with the use of denture adhesives. Um, as we already said, there is a lack of existing guidelines on the optimal use of denture adhesives. We looked at the internet, we did a search everywhere, and we couldn't find a very, let's say, consistent guidance uh, in any direction on any of the existing uh, websites from dental associations, but also from manufacturers. So, and we, the second point is that dental professionals have not been recommending their use consistently because they do see, they do see prescribing denture adhesives as a way of compensating for poor quality of prosthodontic care, a poor reflection on their clinical skills and prosthetic expertise, as Nigel already said before. So these were the, the big challenges that we as a global task force looked upon and tried to answer to a certain degree. And so we developed these science-based guidelines on the optimal use of denture adhesives. Number one, apply a small amount of, denture, amount of denture adhesive cream to a clean and dry denture. One application a day should be sufficient. This is important to communicate that to your patients because easily they overuse it and they apply more than once a day and it's not needed if the, the denture is well fitting. After application, replace the denture in the mouth and firmly close the mouth for a couple of seconds. If the adhesive cream overflows, too much has been applied and the adhesive should be removed. It's important because it should not be swallowed. And patients should not consume food or drink within the first five minutes of application. The third guideline was before sleep, the denture should be removed. The denture and the oral cavity should be thoroughly cleaned and remove, to remove any of the remaining adhesive. In another white paper that we developed uh, about a year ago, we also talked about denture care, and I refer to that white paper to see how you can really clean uh, the best your dentures, uh, the dentures uh, uh, even after uh, the use of denture adhesive creams. And then all patients who wear removable dentures should be enrolled into a regular recall and maintenance program with their dental professional. So it's not because they once have their uh, denture that you should not see your patients back. Uh, you have to make sure that they are enrolled in this um, recall program so that you can really control and the fit of the denture and also if uh, you have to adjust your uh, recommendations for the use of denture adhesive. So these were the guidelines that I think are important that we that is now, there is now a consensus of this global task force. These are really experts. So I think these guidelines should now be, and that's one of the things that your Health Foundation will take on board, is trying to get these guidelines out to everybody, and especially to the dental wearing uh, population, but also to caregivers and dental professionals around the world. The other um, challenge was the evidence for consistent professional recommendations for denture adhesives. And I don't want to come back to all the reasons that dentists are not recommending it, but there is enough evidence at this moment. If you look at, at the literature, if you look at all the benefits that are scientifically proven of the use of denture adhesives, there is enough evidence to make a consistent professional recommendation for denture adhesives toward patients. Here the uh, guidelines that, or the guidance that the, the team wanted to give is that, first of all, patient satisfaction has become a decisive factor for the overall success of prosthodontic treatment in filled denture wares. It's not the fit or the mechanical fit that is the only thing. It's the patient satisfaction who is really important at the end. Secondly, denture adhesives can enhance the retention and reduce foot accumulation beneath well fitting and it's underlined complete dentures. It's really important that these people can eat again 
some like in, uh, peanuts or uh, uh, raspberries or uh, grapes or whatever, so that they don't have to think about the, uh, the issue of um, accumulation of these little seeds underneath their dentures and also because they can really open their mouth uh, well and, uh, uh, and have a normal chewing cycle. Dentures like these can be beneficial to the patient because they may, patient because they may enhance comfort, as we said, provide psychological satisfaction, and that's especially true in the social inter interactions that these people have, increase confidence and this well-being, increase, increase retention and stability, and improve the function. And we have to think about these are not older people who are sitting there and not doing. They live their life much longer now and are living their life and want to live it at the fullest. And that's why we need to really think about how can we uh, improve their comfort. The effectiveness of denture adhesives cannot compensate for significant denture deficiencies. It was something that the, uh, the team was very strict on that this should be uh, said and clearly spelled out because it's the dentist's responsibility to deliver a denture that is that has a fit based on the anatomy and the functional structure of the patient. It should have a perfect intervalvular space. There should be an, an, a, a, a very good centric relation. There should be a balanced occlusion. Also the peripheral and posterior seals, seals should be provided. And there should be a balance of muscle activity around the oral cavity. This is the dentist's responsibility. And these are important to have this well-fitting dentures uh, made, and this is the basis for any of the other uh, uh, guidance that we just gave. Dental professionals should provide guidance and instructions to the patient on the current application and use of the adhesive and on removing it and cleaning the dentures, as I just, just referred to uh, before. And finally, the optimum time to advise on the use of an adhesive varies between patients. There is no um, evidence for one or another, but for well-fitting dentures, the team thought it might occur at a review appointment, appointment, and for patients finding problems with compliance, it could even happen at the time of the fitting or soon after. I recommend the um, white paper to you. Thank you for listening to this webinar, and a huge thanks once again to our three contributors,